The American author Hunter S. Thompson once wrote, We had two bags of grass, 75 pellets of mescaline, five sheets of high-powered blotter acid, a salt shaker full of cocaine, and a whole galaxy full of multicolored uppers, downers, screamers, laughers, and also a quart of tequila, a quart of rum, a case of Budweiser, and a pint of raw ether. The only thing that really worried me was the ether. There's nothing in the world more helpless and irresponsible and depraved than a man in the depths of an ether binge. This passage leaves the reader with two questions. First, what is so horrifying about ether that it put off one of history's most prolific drug enthusiasts? Second, if Hunter S. Thompson was scared to do ether, then who would do it? The first question we'll get to later. But as for the second, well, ether swept the nation of Ireland and then spread to huge parts of northern Europe. Before long, half of Europe was basically obsessed with getting fucked up on ether. In some villages, addiction rates were over 90%. Ether was literally more popular than alcohol, and a lot worse in basically every way. Honestly, the stuff is crazy, and it's even crazier that people have pretty much forgotten about it completely. So, let's talk about the rapid rise and rapid fall of the world's dirtiest drug. So, to understand how crazy the ether epidemic was, it's important to understand what ether is. Diethyl ether, or ether, is made by heating alcohol with sulfuric acid. Now, already, this doesn't really sound like something you should consume, but it's really easy and cheap to produce in huge quantities. One of the most interesting things about ether is that no one really knows where it came from. We know who invented opium, we know who made cocaine first, we know who started smoking weed, but ether is a more mysterious lady. Most people look to a 16th century physician named Valerius Cordus as the first person to create ether. Valerius Cordus' instructions for synthesizing ether appear in a 1561 text. This is the earliest record we have of someone understanding how to produce ether. But scrawled in the margins of this text, there is an intriguing annotation. This annotation was supposedly written by the Swiss physician named Paracelsus, but Paracelsus died 20 years prior to Valerius publishing his book. Whoever wrote this annotation, though, already knew about ether. He describes it in detail, outlining its medicinal properties pretty accurately. He says it tastes agreeable and that chickens will eat it happily. Chickens then fall asleep for a long time and wake up seemingly with no negative side effects. The writer says that ether in smaller doses is basically a miracle drug. It cures all symptoms of all diseases, it alleviates all types of physical pain, and it reduces fever. So a couple hundred years later, ether became really popular as an anesthetic. It was super, super effective, it seemed pretty safe, and it was really cheap to produce. But it was also freakishly flammable, like ridiculously, explosively flammable. Take a look at this experiment from Ohio State University. This is a can of ether vapors. Not even ether itself, just the vapor. Over here is a candle. Watch what happens when the professor opens the can. Candles were everywhere in the 1800s, so after people began realizing that, hey, this stuff is going to burn down all of our hospitals, they stopped using it as an anesthetic. Instead, when the combustion engine came along, much later, it would be used as a starter fluid, but that wouldn't happen until the 1900s. In the meantime, ether found its place as Europe's favorite recreational drug. The history of Britain being shitty to Ireland is really long and complicated. It could be its own video, but suffice to say, in the 1800s, Britain put really high taxes on the importation of alcohol to Ireland. So the Irish began making their own booze. This is one of the reasons for the proliferation of Irish whiskey. There's a lot of booze being made in Ireland at the time. Meanwhile, poor rural people made their own bootleg alcohol. This is all to say the Irish were drinking a lot at the time. This led to a growing Irish temperance movement spearheaded by a Catholic priest named Father Theobald Matthew. He established the Total Abstinence Society. The idea here was simple. People who joined his society took the pledge, which was a commitment to stop drinking alcohol. 
pledge was wildly popular. In the coming years, almost half of the country's population agreed to stop drinking. But these people lived hard lives. Really hard. As it turned out, sobriety was a lot easier said than done. Dr. Kelly was a physician who lived in County Derry during this time. He wanted to keep drinking, or more accurately, he just didn't really want to be sober. Medical students in the 1800s had used ether for recreational purposes. It was basically a party drug for college kids. As a former med student, it was probably where he got the idea. Dr. Kelly realized that ether could be inhaled or drunk in small quantities. The results were pretty similar to alcohol. The user feels euphoric, and the drug just kind of wildly manipulates his or her thinking. If alcohol loosens your inhibitions, an ether high completely obliterates them. Still, the high is quite similar to alcohol intoxication, allegedly with a vaguely psychedelic lining to the experience. Ether is not harmless. It can puncture holes in your stomach. Drinking it literally makes your skin, hair, and sweat smell like ether. The drug makes you drool, and it gives you horrifically foul farts and burps. After all, it's kind of made out of sulfur. Now, you can't be physically addicted to ether. If you use for a long time and stop, nothing really happens. There are no physical withdrawals. But it was and is tremendously psychologically addictive. It has a very rapid onset and a very rapid come down. So that was good in a way. You could do ether and go about your day, but it also made the stuff incredibly addictive. An ether high only lasts about 20 minutes. To keep the high going, you need to keep huffing or drinking the stuff incessantly. But this was perfectly doable. Ether was ridiculously cheap. Now, ever the selfless type, Dr. Kelly began prescribing and sharing his ether with patients and friends. It caught on very quickly. Before long, ether was being sold for recreation in grocery stores, pharmacies, and corner stores. There were even traveling salesmen who would bring ether to those living in the countryside. See, technically, drinking ether didn't violate the pledge. It wasn't alcohol. So the Irish loved it, teetotalers included. One priest even said that ether was, quote, a liquor on which a man could get drunk with a clean conscience. School children as young as 10 were known to drink ether before arriving at the schoolhouse. Teachers could smell it on their skin. When children were sent to buy something from a local shop for their parents, shopkeepers would give them a glass of ether as a treat. When you drink ether, it has a lot of weird side effects. Like I said, one of those is that your skin, hair, and sweat all reek of the drug for weeks and weeks. There are records of entire villages in Ireland smelling like ether. Its odor clung to the buildings and the hedges in these villages. Still, the first attempt to control the ether problem involved adulterating ether with naphtha, which smells and tastes even worse than ether itself. This didn't work at all. People just blended their ether with sugar and kept on drinking. But in 1891, the British government started classifying ether as poison and thus was subject to strict controls on sale and possession. In the coming years, ether drinking in Ireland vanished as quickly as it had arrived. But that was not the end of ether. By then, ether had caught on all around the Baltic countries, most notably in Estonia, Finland, Poland, and Norway. Ether was really popular among the poor, and historically, poor people haven't always known how to read or write, so very little written history exists about the use of ether in these countries. There is, however, one study of Polish ether drinkers in the 1930s. In this study, a researcher looked at about 3,500 Polish people. Of these 3,500, 25% reported having experience drinking ether. It might not seem like a crazy number. But when you zoom in on the country, those numbers do get pretty wild. In some villages, 90% of people regularly drank ether. Throughout the 1930s, the Polish police say that ether smuggling was just as popular as alcohol smuggling. The amount of ether they were seizing was tripling year over year. But ether was cheaper than vodka, so people drank it. A lot. The ether epidemic in Poland was just as bad, maybe worse, than it had ever been in Ireland. Villages reeked of ether, but so did churches and city streets and mines and stores. Ether consumption was not even seen as a bad thing. It was socially acceptable. In 1934, a Polish newspaper wrote that young boys drink ether just like others drink vodka. If a stranger comes to a village, he must bring a 
quarter of ether with him if he wants to dance with local girls. Young, unmarried girls drink because they want to please the boys. A girl who does not drink ether is not popular. The Polish government attempted to curtail ether consumption. They insisted that ether drinking was bad for the common good of the country. But the poor argued that A, they couldn't afford more expensive spirits, and B, the government was only acting in the financial interests of the alcohol industry. Meanwhile, Baltic immigrants took ether drinking with them to the United States. In parts of Michigan, Finns and Swedes would drink ether mixed with whiskey. After Stalin rose to power, he tightened control over Eastern Bloc borders. This made ether smuggling pretty much impossible. Further, privately owned chemical factories ceased to exist under Stalin's regime. As the government took control of these factories, they stopped producing ether, and so the habit pretty quickly disappeared. Very few people in the world consume ether today. It is allegedly still enjoyed in parts of the Baltic region. Some people advocate for ether to be used as an anesthetic in developing countries. Maybe, but the whole exploding thing could make that difficult. Ultimately, ether is basically a forgotten drug in the global zeitgeist. Perhaps that's for the best.